Well, so when I start out on these tours, I usually have an, a, an agenda and prepared remarks, and, and then as I make my way through my venues, and I hear the feedback, and I feel the ambiance of, uh, of the people and the, the throb of the zeitgeist, it all sort of just simply dissolves into an ongoing commentary on our moment in space and time and the various dimensions, adumbrations, and opportunities of our dilemma. But I want tonight to couch it for you in the context of, uh, I guess, an extended metaphor. We could talk about these things many ways, but I find in this particular extended metaphor uh, illuminating. And I start by recalling <clears throat> an observation from someone whose name rarely falls from my lips, uh, and that would be Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff said at one point, or was known to comment, that people are asleep, he said. And he, by implication, suggested people awaken. I'm not sure if he fully grasped the implication for his own product line had that occurred. Uh, but in any case, you're on it, you're with me, yes. <clears throat> it's very hard to give these lectures in such a way so that every person hears something different, uh, which is what is supposed to be going on, you know. Well, so thinking about this comment, that people are asleep, uh, I, I, uh, I see several implications. I ask myself, what is awake in my own notion? And I thought to myself, awake is, for me, awake is where the laws of physics are fully operable, you know? Hurled objects shatter, electricity shocks, I cannot fly, uh, the laws of physics are in operation. In that domain, I consider myself to be fully awake. Now, in terms of occult and spiritual traditions, the admonition to awaken always seems to imply that higher consciousness is approached through an expansion of clarity and awareness. And I, I, that seems obvious. I don't argue with it as a rationalist. But as somebody who has run the edges, I've noticed something somewhat counterintuitive to that teaching. And it's this. It's that to contact the cosmic giggle, to, to have the flow of casuistry begin to give off synchronistic ripples, white caps in the billows of the coincidental ether, if you will, <laughs> to achieve that it requires it, a precondition is a kind of unconsciousness, a kind of drifting, a certain taking your eye off the ball, a certain assumption that things are simpler than they are almost always precedes what Nirsiliad called the rupture of plane that indicates, you know, that there is an archetypal world, an archetypal power beyond, uh, behind profane uh, appearances. And in my own life, for those of you who are conversant with my output, uh, when I went to the Amazon in 1971 and had the experiences that are described in true hallucinations, I had been for many months before that in Asia, smuggling, hanging out, and, and I had taken my eye off the ball. I had become very gentle, very relativistic in my uh, approach to other people's opinions and behaviors. I was easygoing what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Too easy going. Uh, and in that situation of semi-unconsciousness and openness, uh, the cosmic giggle approaches. And I compare this, this is closing of a theme, I compare this to sleep, 
or to states that lie between waking and sleeping. And so, again, an odd take on this remark uh, of Gurdjieff. I remember someone many years ago said to me, uh, they evoked the symbol of the yin and the yang, the two, two tiers folded against each other within a circle. And this person, who was no Rishi, Roshi, Geshe, or Guru, but simply observant, said, uh, it's not the black side, it's not the white side, it's the interface, it's the edge. And I found, uh, by observing sleep, and some of you may recall the motto in Athanasius Kircher's Amphiatrium Sapientium that's chiseled over the alchemist's doorway. I can't do it in Latin, but it says, while sleeping, watch. While sleeping, watch. Uh, and I've noticed that while going to sleep, there is a, a barrier, a place in the process of going to sleep that is like a mercurial edge. It's a river. It's an, a zone of hypnagogia. You often pass through it post-orgasm. It's a place of drifting amoeboid colored after-image lights and then uh, true hallucination, uh, images, strange, transcendental or transpersonal. Uh, Images. Well, so then, so far in the context of pursuing this extended metaphor about sleep, I've talked basically, uh, essentially about the individual's relationship to the concept, to the fact. But there's also a social or a political, a species-wide implication. Uh, it occurs to me that at any given moment, because of the way the planet is as a thing, some considerable percentage of human beings are asleep, always, and many are awake. And so if the world soul is made of the collective consciousness of human beings, then it is never entirely awake. It is never entirely asleep. It exists in, uh, I guess you can hear me. It, it, it exists in some kind of indeterminate zone. And this to me is the clue to understanding something that is personally fascinating to me. And it revolves around why people believe such weird things. And, and why, either as a consequence of the approach of the millennium or the breakdown of traditional values or the density of electromagnetic radiation or for some reason, uh, a balkanization of epistemology is taking place. And what I mean by that is there is no longer a commonality of understanding. I mean, for some people, Quantum physics provides the answers. Their next door neighbor may look to the channeling of archangels with equal fervor. Uh, I mean, if this is not a balkanization of epistemology, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, it is accompanied by a related phenomenon, which is technology or the historical momentum of things is creating such a bewildering social milieu that the monkey mind cannot find a simple story, a simple creation myth or, or redemption myth to lay over the crazy contradictory patchwork of profane techno-consumerist post-McLuhanist electronic pre-apocalyptic existence. And and so into that dimension of anxiety created by this inability to parse reality rushes a bewildering variety of squirrely notions, um, epistemological cartoons, if you will. 
uh, that and conspiracy theory in my humble opinion I'm somewhat immune to paranoia so those of you who aren't you know gaze in wonder uh, <clears throat> Uh, conspiracy theory is a kind of epistemological cartoon about reality. I mean, isn't it so simple to believe that things are run by the greys and that all we have to do is trade sufficient fetal tissue to them and we can solve our technological problems? Or isn't it comforting to believe that uh, the Jews are behind everything or the Communist Party or the Catholic Church? or the Masons. So, well, these are epistemological cartoons. It's, uh, you know, kindergarten stuff in the art of uh, amateur historiography. Uh, I, I believe that the truth of the matter is far more terrifying. That the real, the real truth that dare not speak itself is that no one is in control. Absolutely no one. You know, you don't understand Monica, you don't understand Netanyahu, it's because nobody is in control. This stuff is ruled by the equations of dynamics and chaos. Now there may be entities seeking control, the World Bank, the Communist Party, the rich, the somebody others, but to seek control is to uh, take enormous aggravation upon yourself uh, because th this, this process that is underway will take the control freak by the short and curly and throw them against the wall. <laughs> it's like trying to control a dream, you see. The, the global destiny of the species is somehow unfolding with the logic of a dream. Well, now a Jungian would say, no surprise here, history is the collective dream of humanity. It is run by archetypal energies. It is downloaded by the zeitgeist into the various milieus and epochs of, of uh, which it is composed. Uh, this, this seems reasonable to me. I don't, I don't want to give you the impression it's too linear to understand that what I am saying is that awake is good, asleep is bad. I, what I would rather do is explain this whole gradient of possible positioning vis-a-vis -vis your life and your destiny, these choices that you have, and then have people understand that they choose you choose to be asleep or partially asleep or fully awake or to be one part of the time and in some situations and one part of the time and in other uh, situations. Now, if in fact uh, we exist inside some kind of morphogenetic field that is created by the sum total of human minds on the planet, and if in fact in half or more of those minds at any given moment the rules of the dream hold sway, then it is no uh, surprise that when we make our way into society or, or just when we live our lives, there's an eeriness to it. There's a fatedness to it. There's a plottedness to it. Uh, you know, we are inside some kind of engine of narrative, I believe. Uh, you know, some science fiction writers such as Greg Egan and others have suggested that this could even be a form of recorded medium. The, it look, you can see the thumbprints of editors on our reality if you are truly paying attention. I mean, if you're a devotee of the theory of stochastic and, and uh, <clears throat> random unfolding of events, then you have to look very carefully at how unrandom and how mythical and archetypal uh, most people's lives are. Uh, you know, if you take psychedelics and hurl yourself to the edge and spend time with 
strange aboriginal people in remote parts of the world, the cosmic giggle becomes your friend. But in fact, um, ordinary people's lives, everyone's lives, are touched by deep magic. And I've, you know, again, the, the primary datum is experience. And then the models are built backward from the primary data without prejudice and in an attempt to transcend historical momentum. And when I do that, what I see is that the, uh, the carrier of the, of the field of the cosmic giggle in most people's lives is love. Love is some kind of output which messes with the uh, entropic tendency toward probabilistic behavior in nature. What do I mean by that? I mean you can be the janitor at Microsoft and uh, the chief, the vice president and chief of operations, his daughter can bring him lunch one day and you can from a distance have your eye fall upon her and fall in love with her and you know from that point to having the five children she bears you go off to Harvard and the Sorbonne it's just a matter of running the clock forward <laughs> and these things have I mean to you it may seem like a miracle but to to those of us who are students of human happenstance it's inevitable I mean, you can launch your story. And uh, I've, you know, in the course of taking psychedelics and looking at my life and other people's lives and narrative, I, I think that the, the secret of, I don't want to say anything as pretentious as transcendence or enlightenment, but the secret of, uh, of taking hold of uh, one's destiny is to understand that one is a character. A character is a different thing than this model you inherit out of the idea that you're a three-dimensional animal inside a democracy with a Christian heritage and uh, you know a Dewey Decimal cataloging system or or whatever. Uh, anyway, these are some of the notions that occur to me in the context of, of, uh, of comparing dream uh, on many scales. It's, you have to uh, really struggle, I think, to believe that you actually live inside the model of reality that science and Newtonian physics and the mathematical analysis of nature have given us. Uh, you know, not to get too philosophical here, but uh, for positivist philosophers, everything that is important, color, feeling, taste, tone, ambition, apprehension, appetition, these things are called uh, secondary qualities. In other words, they're peripheral they arise at a lower level of understanding they are somehow determined by the presence of the animal body and hence dismissible by a theory of pure abstraction which says you know what is real is spin charge angular momentum none of these things are very rich concepts uh, for a living human being who knows what any of these things are you know so one I mean there we don't have time in a in a situation like this to explore all the implications uh, of this dream analogy that I'm pursuing but one that interests me uh, is the plasticity of time in the dream. And I think I would argue as the devil's advocate that it is the plasticity of, of historical time 
and the acceleration, the sense of an out of control spin up or spin down into new domains of possibility that is the strongest evidence present at hand that we are in some kind of dream. I've struggled my whole life with, I've, I've always believed or I've always felt the power of the statement, the world is made of language. But of course, you think about this proposition for 30 seconds and the question that arises then is, if the world is made of language, then why isn't it the way I want it to be? You know, why does it have own, it has its own raison d'etre, even if it is, uh, language. Well, I think in, it's appropriate to speak of this in, uh, to an audience as digitally sophisticated as I assume you must be. I think the primary insight that has been secured in the, in, uh, here at the end of the 20th century, the primary contribution of, of 20th century thinking, if you will, is to have understood finally that information is primary, that this world, this cosmos, this universe, this body and soul are all made of information. Information is a deeper and more primary concept than space, time, matter, energy, charge, spin, angular momentum. The world is made of language. The implication for the digerati is that reality can therefore be hacked. <laughs> if reality is made of language, then what we're saying is that it's code. And if it's code, then it is far more deeply open to manipulation than we ever dared dream. I mean, we've been messing around on the desktop, uh, opening files with religions and political systems and xenophobic theories and racial superiority, all this crap that haunts the human historical adventure. It means we have not addressed the deeper levels. And in thinking about this and the relationship to dream and human culture, it, I have realized that <clears throat> cultures are, are like operating systems. We are like hardware. The human animal is a piece of biological wetware slash hardware. And uh, it has been, we know, pretty much as we confront it today for at least 140,000 years. Uh, at Classis River Cave Mouth in South Africa, they have excavated Homo sapiens sapiens skeletons, a hundred thousand years old, and that person could have sat in the front row here tonight and nobody would have batted an eyebrow. So the human hardware has been in place uh, for a while. What has changed rapidly in comparison to the rates of biological evolution is uh, are the operating system. The people who excavated Ur, which was at that time thought to be the world's first city, and in any case is the city seven millennia old, uh, when, when they excavated the central plaza at Ur, they discovered that a, a black basaltic slab had been set up there uh, by the earliest kings of Ur and that was the cultural operating system and if in a deal trading goats for olives the dispute arose people had reference to the central operating system and these things were determined well now Ur 101 was fine for olives and goat trading but it didn't support uh, higher mathematics, it didn't support uh, rational exploration of nature, uh, it didn't support astrological knowledge about the, uh, the movement of the stars. As we have gone forward through culture, we have swapped out these operating systems. And at each swap out, 
there there has been a lot of hair pulling and cussing and screaming. Anyone who has installed a new operating system is completely familiar uh, with that sickening from the bowels kind of coldness as you know you realize it all hangs by uh, a thread. Uh, now, this situation or this operating system metaphor, I think, is a useful one for understanding, and again, a circle closes, the balkanization of epistemology that causes me such anxiety. Uh, if you meet uh, an Aboriginal person from the Amazon, for example, they may be running Witoto 3.0 as their operating system nicely supports uh, animistic magic, uh, huge capacity when it comes to making fish traps and bird traps. Uh, Witoto is a powerful operating system for a rainforest aboriginal. Uh, in our culture, you know, there are, I have no idea, at least 10 or 20 operating systems all going at the same time. Uh, some will run Mormonism. Some will support Catholicism. Others, uh, Kabbalah goes at the speed of light. Uh, others support quantum physics. Some support econometrics. Others support political correctness. And uh, these things are mutually exclusive. And, and so looking at this and looking at this clash of operating systems, I've come to the conclusion, and some of you may have heard me say this before, that uh, culture is not your friend. That's the final conclusion. You see, well, this came to me a few months ago when I had my yearly physical, and as I was buttoning up, my doctor said to me, he said, you know, uh, in the 19th century, uh, most people your age were dead. And, uh, and I realized that, uh, that this was true and that one of the, among all the revolutions that we are enduring, one of them is that we live nearly twice as long as people lived uh, very recently in the past. Well, culture is a kind of neoteny. And I don't want to belabor that at great length, but for those of you who are not biologists, neoteny is the retention of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. It's used to describe animal behavior. For instance, I'll give the most spectacular example of neoteny. There is a kind of animal which lives in ponds in Africa, and it reproduces like a fish. It lays eggs on the bottom of these ponds. More fish-like animals come from these eggs and so forth. However, if the pond dries up, the creature undergoes metamorphosis and becomes an animal somewhat like a gecko and lays eggs. And from these eggs come creatures that are like geckos. In other words, this is an animal which actually achieves sexual maturity in two forms depending on environmental stress. Spectacular example of neoteny. Turning to human beings, a less spectacular example, but relevant to us, is our hairless, our general body hairlessness compared to other primates. We look like fetal apes. Uh, human beings look like fetal apes. Uh, why? What is neoteny? Well, this is hotly debated among evolutionary biologists. But the point I want to make is a socio-political comment, which is culture itself is some kind of neotenizing force. Because what it, culture provides is a bunch of rules, so you don't have to think, and a bunch of myths, so you don't have to think again. The culture has all the answers, you know. You want to know where people came from? 
Well, when the sky god got out of his canoe at first waterfall and took a leak, then we, the true people, appeared like ants, and we've been living here any ever since. Oh, huh. gee, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad I asked. Uh, you know, this is what culture does for you. So. But now technology throws a curve, and the curve is that we live so long that we figure out what a scam this is. We figure out that what you're supposed to work for isn't worth having. We figure out that our politicians are buffoons. We figure out that professional scientists are reputation-building, grab-tailing weasels. We discover that all organizations are corrupted by ambition. Um, you know, you get the picture. We figure it out. Well, then, as intellectuals, and anybody who figures it out is an intellectual, believe me, because they're slinging the programming to push you the other way. Uh, so then intellectuals, defined as people who figure it out, uh, discover that you are alienated. That's what figuring it out means. It means you understand that the BMW, the Harvard degree, this whatever it is, that this is all baloney and manipulated and hyped and that mostly you have a bunch of clueless people who are figuring out which fork they should use. Uh, <laughs> but this position is presented as alienation and therefore somehow tinged with the potential for pathology. You know, it's a bad thing to be alienated. 